Okay, yes. So the cute thing about this move f5 is it actually traps this queen on g6. Queen on g6 has nowhere to go. And so that means that because we're being attacked, we're always happy to trade. And this is no exception. We're going to play the move queen e8. Queen. Now, we're not afraid of them taking our pawn because we can just take, take the bishop. So they're going to take our queen, or else we take and give them an even weaker pawn structure. They're going to take our queen. The question is, how should we play here? Whoops. How should we play? Okay, I'm going to talk about that move as well. Uh, there was another move that was being suggested. Should we take with the knight? Should we go rook f takes e8? Or should we go rook d takes e8? Feel free to type the answer, yeah. Yeah, Richard, that's good, yeah. It's actually important. Yes, uh, Milan, you raise your hand. Milan, I want to try to answer, sorry. <laughs> oh, is, no, no, please. Is rook f take? Take e8. Take e8. Yes. Generally, Charles de Milan, it'd be better if you type the answer, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Yes, Ned, Nader here. Yeah. Okay. Right there. And I'll, I'll be able to respond to you, and anything you say, I'll respond to anything you say. As I, I mean, I know a few people are new, but I'll just repeat from the last class and the class before. Anything you say, purposely make it private, so that way you're not influenced by anyone else, and I can engage with your ideas, just you and me. Uh, so you get, nobody knows what anyone is saying, and that's purposeful. I just want to make sure I hear your thoughts and you're not distracted by anyone else's thoughts. The right answer is 100% you want to take with the F rook. And the reason is that the, F, the E file is about to open up, and we want to make sure that the D file is uh, putting pressure on the D4 pawn. We're, our pawn is weak on E6, much weaker than F5, but that is completely fine because we're going to trade it off the next move. Almost regardless of what they play, we're going to take. If they take us, our whole game plan is to play against this pawn and rush the queen side. Now, somebody asked, why not queen f7? This is a good question. So maybe I should ask you, why is queen f7 worse? Uh, how can white to play play against queen f7? And this move is a small mistake. Yeah, Isaac is right. So, so our queen's still trapped, so we'll take. But now this is where it comes important. What do we play here? Yeah, George, Isaac, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, Bo, of course. But an easier way to write it is like this. You'll save more time. This is a, that's the way you write it in chess coordinates as well. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. You're learning. Don't be, as I say, best place to make a mistake is right here, right now. Got nothing to lose. F takes E6. Of course, that advances our opponent's king. And it seems like, why is this an issue? This king is fine. It's an endgame. But we can give our opponents some issues here. What is the best move for white here to uh, put pressure on black? Now, remember, putting pressure doesn't always necessarily mean give checks and try to go for mate. There's no queens on the board. It's going to be kind of hard to imagine giving mate. But how can we give our opponent the most amount of issue here, most amount of problems? Absolutely, Richard.
Rook F5, I wouldn't be too scared about Rook F5. I can probably just defend with A6 or even Rook D5 I might have. So if you go Rook F5, I think Black is, is okay here. Because even though you can check, I can probably come back. I think Black is happy. Think about what changed, right? Okay, we took, the king takes, the king is coming in. But what was the king doing on F7 that it doesn't do on E6 anymore? And how can white take advantage of this? This is something you should always think about. Whenever your opponent makes a move, always think about how you can potentially take advantage of such a move. And this position is no different. Two thoughts I always want you to have. That one and how do you activate your least active pieces? The king is exposed, certainly. But the king on f7 was also defending this pawn. Now you might think, oh, who cares? It's a pawn far away. But this means that we're able to develop our pieces that are currently doing nothing. We're getting into the game uh, with tempo. Yeah, but that's 100%. We're going to play the move knight f5. And you're like, oh, Mark, who cares? We could just defend it with our rook, right? So rook f7 or rook g8, it doesn't really matter. Firstly, if they bring their king back, white has already made a small victory. Black has made a concession moving back and forth. And if you go rook g8, this is actually a big problem because now I would argue white is almost completely winning here. What move should white play here? Always seek maximum activity, giving your opponents the most amount of problems. Yeah, Nader, that's right. Simply put, activate your pieces that are doing the least amount of work. Currently, that's the rook on d1. It's defending a pawn that doesn't need defense. Our knight on f5 is doing all the work. Uh, we could bring in the rook. Now, if they advance their king, seeking a blockade, this is seemingly good, but it does not work for what reason? Why is this a mistake? Yeah, knight e7. It's a fork, 100%. Whoops. And if they bring their king back, even knight h6, a uh, little bit tricky position, not so easy. <laughs> even though we are winning, actually, we're not even winning a pawn there because after rook f6, they have h5. No need, no need. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Uh, if they bring their king back, it doesn't really matter where. Why is white doing great here? We're following one of the most basic principles of chess. Uh, this move follows a lot of very basic principles. Bishop h6. Uh, I don't know about that. That's it's too much. No need to go fancy. No need to go fancy. Keep it simple. As I said, keep it simple. Simply put, rook e7 is tasty enough. We can take this pawn. King is going to be in bad shape. In fact, there's no good square for the king to move. If it goes to g6, once we take the pawn, now it has to worry about another fork. And even if white is not winning here, they are definitely not on the worst side. Uh, black guy is going to have to play very accurately because suddenly this rook can't move. Knight e7 is an issue. If the rook moves, g7 is hanging. So that is why we play queen e8. Okay, next. Homework number two. In this position, our opponent seemingly has no isolated pawns. So it's like Mark gave us a rubbish question. Now, I may give you rubbish questions, but this is not one of them. What should Black play to create that isolated pawn that we so desperately seek? Yes, Isaac. First things first, we're going to take on d4. If we go cd4, they'll take back. And the issue here is they're putting pressure on the spawn. They're happy to trade it. And if we avoid the trade, we're currently blocking our own bishop. Of course, white is probably still worse here, but not too much worse, especially after a move like knight c3. White is starting to get active, hitting our bishop, potentially later putting pressure on e4. Maybe bishop f4 will come next. There's going to be reasons to be concerned. That is why we take the other way. Now, they have to take our queen, because if they take on d4, how should white play here? Yeah, 
Hundred percent, Bo. Yeah, you're writing it perfectly, Bo. Too. That's perfect. And so much faster too, right? No need to say the whole word. It's bang, bam, bo. Queen G three. Now, of course, they don't want to triple isolate their pawns. Jesus. And if they don't do that, it's going to be a free pawn on D four. Black is completely winning. They are going to take the queen. No, it's okay. It's okay. They're going to take the queen and they're going to take the pawn. And that leaves us with the last move of this puzzle. What move should black play? Um, we want to make sure this pawn stays isolated. We will play C4. Now, very important, uh, this uh, pass pawn, we're certainly hitting B3. If they take, we're going to be blockading next with our knight. Not only are we going to be blockading, our pieces are way more active, especially if the knight gets here, there's already going to be tactics of taking and fork. Really, black can have a really nice position here. Okay, this one. This is, uh, so there's a grandmaster that lives in Montreal. Uh, I play, I've played him many times. His name is Bator Sambuov, and this is his pet opening. It's pet line. How should white play here? So if you remember the previous class, so taking the pawn is good. We should start here. I don't want to get ahead of myself. If we remember the previous class, we spoke about blockading. And our natural blockading route is this and this, but we can't do that. And you'd be like, oh my, who cares? We can go knight d4. But if you recall on the previous class, we need this knight to defend our king. So this knight is actually misplaced on d4. And first of all, black can take it at any moment. They could castle first. Let's say white makes some improving move, they could just take. And black is only gonna be slightly worse here. It's more or less around the realms of equality, especially it's a completely symmetrical structure. Black should not be much worse here. So we do not, we do not want to play knight d4. Richard has, yeah, okay, Richard, that's not bad. There is a, I'm, I'm okay, Richard, with your idea, but there's actually something else here. I want you to specifically think about this bishop that is currently not in the game. Think about how we can try to activate it. What does that look like in this position? There's actually two different moves that are going to help activate the bishop, and they may look nearly identical, but one is much better than the other. So the basic thought is, oh, Mark, we can just Fianchetto, which is fine. Black will castle, we can Fianchetto, and White can Fianchetto, and they're okay here. But what would be a more ambitious way to Fianchetto and try to take more space at the same time? I have no problem with B3. B3 is okay, but there's a bit, bit more ambitious way to develop that bishop by trying to take more space on the queen side with tempo. What does that look like? What other path can this bishop take to being placed on this diagonal apart from the move B3? Yes, Milan, yes. Bo, yeah. But Bo, we need to prepare that move first. No need to, we're, it's a positional class. No need to sacrifice. We're not ready for that. A2. A3. A3, yeah. And the point is that when, once they castle, we can play the move B4. Now, and this takes the temple from our opponent's bishop. And when they move, before we Fianchetto, let's see if anyone can spot the move I was kind of looking for in this position. What move can white play? And remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to get this knight here, which will make your next move much more easier to find. Nader, yeah, wow. It's like you've been here last class, Nader. No? Hiding? Or maybe you're just too strong. B5. The simple idea is we want to kick away our opponent's knight. We want the knight to move. And wherever the knight moves, it's just not going to be as good as it is on C6. Um, 
if they move, we could also take and give them the ice they pawn uh, that we could start putting pressure on on a6. And if they take back, then this is, we're so happy. This is just perfect because how should I play? this and this coming next. You pick your move order. I'm not too picky here. The only time you should be picky is if they play knight e4, then you must play bishop b2 first, because if you play knight d4, there's knight c3. So we will be in kettle first, and then we centralize our knight, and white is going to be very happy. All of our pieces are beautiful suddenly. And that is why we played this key move a3. This actually is an idea that is quite common. A lot of people forget about this idea, but it's it's quite a useful one. When a6 stops us from going knight d4, a lot of times we play b5, but you want to make sure that knight is on c6, because if there was no knight, then black would just disregard this move. But black has to react to it. If they move their knight, we'll happily just develop our bishop as well, and we could later move this knight as well, if necessary. Also, we can reroute it through e2, because black is going to be wasting a lot of time. All right, this one. You're not sure if you like, you're not sure if you like this position because black, yeah, sure. This pawn is not the strongest, but keep in mind, this pawn is not that strong either. We both have weaknesses. Queen B3 is coming to put pressure on B7. And in fact, we also have that file to put pressure on this pawn. It's a double-edged position in that regard, but very simply put, we have been able to strengthen the position of our knight. And notice, if we need to, we could always come back to defend the pawn. So I wouldn't be too worried about losing any material. And keep in mind, if they do play bishop c5, we could also play a4. So losing that pawn is not going to be an imminent, something that we have to be too worried about. It's not an imminent danger. OK, black to play. And this one was rather basic, I would say. Very simply put, I, I think you could not get easier here. You could, I couldn't make it any easier. We want to follow just very basic moves. First things first, always think about how you can develop with tempo. That should take priority. So how can we try to take space with tempo? So Richard, I absolutely agree with the moves. I just disagree with the order. So where's this bishop going? It's our first thought. And the bishop on c4, yeah. Nader, yeah, Nader is good. Yeah, bow, yeah, for sure. We're going to hit the bishop first. We're worried about queen f3 hitting the rook and the knight. Oh, I must have made a miscalculation because I think in my answers, I saw the move queen b6. But why does this not work? What did I miss? So thank you for catching my mistake. Why is this a blunder? I thought that we trapped the queen. Everyone's giving me the right answer, but not shouldn't be the first move that should be played. Change the move order. What would be the best move here for white? You can take the rook first for free and then knight d seven. So I made a mistake. Yes, my apologies. Thank you. That's why you guys are here. I'm, I'll be making mistakes. Uh, this is going to be a learning process for both of us. We will have to play knight f6 first. Um, queen f3 is a serious issue and after their next move let's say they develop the rook we can play b5 if they play a4 sorry b5 and we develop our bishop we could probably play here and then something like this if they play a4 to stop us from playing b5 what move should black play here
If we go to knight c6, they're just going to take it and give us an isolated pawn. It's okay, it's okay. B6. If they play queen f3 now, what move can black play? There's two different moves. One, I would say, is reasonably better than the other one. Should we go here or should we go here? Just try to support our bishop to go to b7. That is the question. And there's actually an almost bizarre looking reason for why one is better than the other. And the reason why rook a7 is slightly better is because after, let's say, bishop b7, let's say the queen moves, what move do you think black can play to immediately put pressure on the king side? And it's because of this rook being here. What move can black play? Yes, that is a good job. And it's actually a rather thematic idea. Okay, fine. I'll play rook d1 so this pawn's not hanging. Yes, queen a8. Now you think, oh my god, what is what is this crime against humanity that we're committing to this rook? First of all, I agree. I agree with you. But it's going to be very difficult for them to defend this pawn. And this rook is actually going to later swing over here once we move this bishop. So no need to overreact. Of course, if you don't like that, you could also park your rook here. I wouldn't say there's too great a difference. The issue, though, is when they play queen e2 is that this pawn is hanging. So there could be some problems that white puts on the black position here. Maybe queen c8, but just not a pleasant way of dealing with things. Okay. Okay, so here, yeah, I agree. Yeah, Richard, 100%. So here, Black's knights are absolutely misplaced. So it's time to unmisplace them, if that's a word. To put them in the best squares possible, what move should we play? Probably the last move was knight b4, and the bishop on c2 came to e4. A lot of times this is actually an idea for white to give up their bishop just to give black the isolated pawn. But this move is a mistake. We'll be able to hit our opponent's bishop. And when the bishop moves back, what should we play? We don't have to rush with this move. We can play this move later. But the thing we have to figure out is what do we do with our worst piece on the board? which is this bishop odd c8. Always think about the weakest pieces you have and how do you activate them. Isaac is right. Nader, yeah. A6 is not necessary because there's no tempo to be had on b5. And in fact, just randomly playing a6, b5, for instance, is not that good because this pawn could be a big issue. Kind of that same example, Richard, that we talked about in the previous example. The a6 pawn is going to be a much bigger issue than b2. White's going to be able to put pressure. So we just want to play b6 here. There's no way they can really put pressure on us here. If they go knight e5, we definitely don't want to play knight d5 because of this fork. So we just solve our problems. We get rid of queen f3. That's not a move. And then we come here when we're ready, knight d5 now. Assuming some normal developing move, we will just play knight d5. Actually, the last question I should ask, if they take, how should we take the knight? With the queen, the pawn, the knight, or the bishop? Especially if you were here last week, we know what the answer is. Remember. Wow, this I got some polarizing answers. I had two people say knight, one person say queen, one person say bishop. Nobody has said pawn. Well, that's a good thing, because that would be the wrong answer. Um, wow. We have, yeah, best way is to take with the queen. No question about it. Why do we not take with the knight? Because you need this knight to defend your king. The bishop is okay. It's not a bad move, but the whole point of taking with the queen is not only to threaten mate. 
Assuming they defend me, let's say they play f3, what's our next move going to be? And this is solely because of queen takes d5. We're going to be able to bring new pieces into the game, attacking our opponent's pieces. We get everything we ever dreamed of and more. How do we bring more pieces into the game here? One well, Lucia Black play. This is just an absolutely terrific position for Black. This pawn is just at a stark weakness. I would argue that the, I would think the pawn is falling instantly. Rook d8, and after bishop e3, I just have to show this. Maybe I should ask, is bishop c5 a good move here for black? Just tell me yes or no, and then uh, if you want, try to tell me why. Richard, why? I could just take it with the knight, no? And then queen takes, and I should be okay. There's a pin. And then I'm also threatening maiden one on d2. Okay, people are saying yes, no. Somebody said no, and then wait, or yes, and then wait. I'll give you some time, dude. Don't worry. But what if I told you it's a little bit more complicated than that? I'm not saying you're right or wrong. I'm just saying there's more to it than it may initially appear. It's an interesting question. Okay. Bishop c5. Bishop e4, knight takes e4, dc5. Then I could take with the knight. Black's up a pawn now. I could also take on e5 as well, hitting your queen on d1. Okay, so bishop e4 is not a move here. If we take the bishop, why is white good here? What move does white have? That probably quite a few of you missed. Seemingly white is completely lost, but it's actually black that is losing. In fact, Fisher has won with this quite a few times. Bishop, you know, doing some damage on h7, and then we just take the queen. So, so bishop c5, not a good move. No need to go for tactics in this position. This is a mistake. Obviously, the very important to calculate everything through. This is my point. This is a mistake a lot of people make. They go for tactics when it's totally unnecessary. Why play bishop c5? Just, you know what I would do? is I'll play rook c8 and not think twice. This move just cannot be bound. We're bringing a new root root piece into the game. It's a great move. We're activating our pieces, and then we can think about what we do next. Black's position is fantastic. All right. Okay, now back to the basics as we like it. It does. The rook order does matter simply in this position because we bring in this rook attacking our opponent's pawn. Usually it doesn't really matter, but if you get a chance to do it with tempo, then it's much better. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. All right, here you get it as basic of a position as it seems. And actually, we spoke about this in class last week, this exact position. We are going to take. If we go, we could go rookie one, but the problem is c4 here, and we're not able to give our opponent an isolated pawn. They're going to castle next. We're going to take. Okay. Now, they cannot take with the bishop. They actually literally can't because we could stop them from castling with what? How do we stop our opponent with, from castling? Let's bother our opponent a little bit. No, but then I can just castle later, right? The queen. Oh, you mean here? Oh, you mean here, queenie too? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, maybe you're right. I mean, actually, okay, then maybe I should think about this. Yeah, maybe this is actually, I shouldn't have dismissed it. Maybe this is okay as well. I mean, I guess it could just tra transpose. Black would just castle and then we would just take. So you're probably right. Uh, yeah, so my apologies, you're right. Uh, bishop takes, rookie water is good because after the bishop slides back, how should white play? Yeah, we just uh, bring the queen. Put pressure on the bishop. Yeah. Now, now it's now makes more sense. If they take with the knight, then we just go on our ways, improving our pieces. How should I play? Rookie one. Now they'll just castle, and they're looking to put their knight in. But we can just go knight b3. And remember, we welcome this trade because that means that we're able to put pressure on a7. If they castle, great. We just develop just the same. Complete fine. Okay, that's the homework. If you have any questions about that, please uh, don't be afraid to ask me about it later. Each class, each week, we'll take up the homework. Hopefully, it won't take as long. So, my apologies about that. This was the exchange French. Yeah, the Tarash variation with 92. Okay. Let's talk about very general blockading. That's basically what we're doing. Not isolate pawns. You guys are safe from that. Everything but isolate pawns is where I will come in. So we look at this position. Why it's obviously better. No doubt about that. But we have a spatial advantage. Our opponent has these doubled pawns, double backward pawns. On isolate pawn on a7. It looks, it looks great. But the, this is where a lot of people go wrong. The question is, what now? And let me throw that question to you. What now? Now, this is going to be one of the more difficult positions, I got to say. Everything else will be much more simple than this. So first things first, we really have to realize, and three of you gave me the right answer, right? This, what well, we, they, they can't go C5 yet, right? D5 is hanging, but yeah, generally, I don't even know if they want to go C5, because if they ever go C5, we also might have, not, but then D4. Okay, C5, currently not an issue. These, this square is very weak. Why is it a weak square? Because these pawns are backwards. Well, you always want to take advantage of your opponent's backward pawns. Sometimes it's similar to isolated pawns. Um, in the sense of the pawns beside it can't attack it because they have already advanced. And so the square is quite weak. Nader, you're actually right. You're, that's perfect. So knight a4. We want to jump in. And so black plays knight e6. Right? I mean, knight g7 with the idea of knight e6. How should white play here? As we see, the knight, their knight wants to come in. So if we just go here, they'll go there, and we're just trading knights. The first thought should be, maybe we could bring a new piece to help us attack the C5 square. We could go C4, but what does that do for us? Let's, excuse me, let's say they play 96. What would be the follow-up? In fact, now D4 could be a big issue. I would think, oh, you mean, so, Isaac, when, right now or after C4? So this, this was the recommendation. So what if they just play bishop b7? I know this looks really ugly, but now d4 could be a huge problem for them, for us. I really am worried about d4 because it effectively gives them a pass pawn. I just don't want to see it. And if we go c5, which seems to completely block the position, their bishop is bad here, but then it could just activate over here. Our focus should be on playing c4 at some point. It just doesn't have to be right now. Our queen, if you notice, is actually doing nothing. Shockingly, it seems like there's something on d5, but it's really not doing anything. Can we maneuver our queen to try to take more control over this c5 square? 
which is that blockading square we so desperately crave. Yeah, Nader, and then where after that? Where are you going? No, but you, Nader, that's not bad, but the question is, where do you put your queen? That's what I care about. So my question is, where, what are we doing with the queen? Where are we putting? Yes, yes, Nader, that's that's right. So if we go queen e1 and then queen f2, you already know what I'm going to say. We'll move what black play. It's a move I've spoken about before. They can take be more aggressive here trying to take more space. They can go d4. And rook d1, shockingly, doesn't work because in this position, they're taking our queen with check. OK, this is just hopeless. And if we move the bishop back, they suddenly can be very aggressive. Suddenly, the position completely changes. We can't put our knight here. Uh, sure, we can go bishop f3, but then they'll go rook b8, and it's chaos on the board and totally unnecessary. This is what I want you guys to avoid. When you have that edge, you want to build on it rather than a, a, allow your opponent to come back in by creating chaos. The principal decision is to control the c5 square, and we could do that with the move queen a5. Why not queen c3? Okay, so queen c3 is actually a blunder. It seems like a good move. Why is queen c3 a blunder? This is a two, there's a two move tactic here for black. How does black to play win material? Just give me the next two moves for black. And then what? Think about why the queen came here. There's certainly attack in this pawn, which would attack your rook. Yeah, Isaac Nader, that's good. Richard, perfect. Yeah, 100%. We're going to, first things first, we're going to deliver a fork. And even though they take our pawn hitting our rook, we can play what's called a Zwitschenzug, an in between move, an intermezzo. An intermediate move, an in-between move. There's so many different words you can call it. I've given it to you in three different languages. We are able to both hit our opponent's rook, maintain the pressure on our opponent's bishop, and, def and, and attack the queen all in one. And it's with a very simple and very tiny move, bishop d7. And everything is defended. And the the two pieces are attacked. So that's why we play queen a5. Now, certainly, they don't want to play d4 here. They're going to get pinned. And if they tried to prepare d4 with a move like bishop b7, how should we play here? They probably, they want, they're looking forward to something like d4 and then uh, c5. Nader, can I not? Oh, but is, is your idea after d4? Okay. Yeah. Rook d1, d4 is actually a blunder here because of what? Suddenly this opens up something. What specifically? Yes. The, the our opponent's king suddenly becomes exposed. We could take advantage of that. And we will. We definitely will. C4, hitting the knight and also the pawn. Our next move is going to be to play C4. This is just a fantastic position for white. Knight C5 is coming next. As there's the famous quote, the threat is stronger than the execution. Our whole idea was to play knight C5, but even though they stopped it, we we're still able to build and improve our pieces. And that's all I'm looking for. This is a positional class. Look to improve your pieces. Okay, this is one of the most famous and egregious examples of a blockade actually. Uh, in fact, I'm not even going to be looking for moves. I have no questions here. I just want to demonstrate how powerful a blockade is. The knight is, as we know from last week, the best blockading piece. Our opponent's pieces are horrible. And we're basically almost winning through Zugzwang here, right? Their best bet is to sacrifice the bishop. This position is literally won through Zugzwang. This position is hopeless. 
the knights are doing such an amazing job of making sure that our opponent's pieces can't activate. And this position is straight out of Nimzovich's My System, a book that was written 100 years ago. And actually the inspiration for one of, for the, this topic. So God bless Aaron Nimzovich, may he rest in peace. A great and interesting position. Okay, what is our evaluation of this position? Is this a win? This is a draw. It's white to play. White pawn going this way. Don't overthink it. I promise you, this is not a trick question. Wow, I, I got some, I got three, four people saying it's a win, two people saying it's a draw. And there's this famous quote by Mark Twain that comes into effect in this position that I think is great. When you're on the side of the majority, it's a good idea, a good idea to pause and reflect. The draw is the right answer. There's actually no way to win. Your thought would be, what? Isn't this ridiculous? Can't we just check the king? The problem is the king is actually still theoretically blockading the pawn. We're no longer going to be able to kick out the king. And sure, this knight is bad, but okay, we advance it, and then what? Their knight is just going to sacrifice itself for the pawn. There's absolutely nothing. There's not even remotely close to anything here. There's not even, even a shred of hope. Black just brings in the knight. That's it. You, as long as the knight's not hanging, black or trapped, there are even some positions where the knight is trapped and it's a draw, but there's none of that here. You cannot trap the knight. It has too many options in this position. This bishop would need to be on d7, which you can't get in one turn to control all the knight squares. This is a draw. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, no, I, we don't. I don't want to do this position. Let me delete this. So here, let's talk about our opponent's um, bishop. It's blockading our pawn from promoting. How should white play to win? Win. It's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen move idea. But you really, sh your intuition should really kick in after the third, the second or third move. Yeah, how, how, how do we win? How, how should I play? I will retitle the chapters. I apologize. I just deleted one that I don't think was necessary. So we got to get rid of the bishop. It's blockading everything. So we're going to play rook b8. Rook cut blocks. Now notice, if we do nothing, the bishop just moves. Yeah, Isaac, good job. So strong, Isaac, so strong. Isaac gave me like 10 moves. Rook b7. But what does that do? We're just hoping. We're like, please. But you know what's funny? Is that rook b7 actually is one of the only moves that lose in this position. Because in this position, after we queen, black is going to pick up this pawn. And we're losing. We're going to remove the blockading piece, which is going to be something that I'm going to reinforce later, the bishop. It's pretty close to what Nader you gave me, but as you'll see in a moment, we are just not only just in time to save it, we're just in time to win the game. We're going to bring in our king, and you think, what? The king is so far away from this pawn. The king is certainly coming in time. Does anyone know what this position is called, there's actually a very important endgame idea that is part of this. It starts with letter M, it's two words. 
Zugzwang is definitely a part of this, no doubt. But there's a term that starts with letter M. Does anyone know what it's called? Mutual Zugzwang? No. Mind squares. What does that mean? Well, if our king, if the king is here, here, whoever, so let me just illustrate that. Whoever moves here, it's mutual Zugzwang. So whoever moves, loses loses whoever moves if you the black king moves they lose the e6 pawn if the white king moves they lose the e5 pawn and the e6 pawn promotes sadly for black as they try to attack the pawn from a different square other than f5 we're able to immediately attack the e6 pawn with one move how does white win No, I, I'm gonna, I, I recognize what I'm about to ask is beyond the scope of this class, but I think this is incredibly important. Due to opposition, what is, the, what is this position? Is this a win or a draw because of opposition? What is it? Is it what is this? It's opposition, right? Well, it's when your opponent's king faces your king. Don't let me trick you. Opposition does not play a role on the sixth rank, regardless of whose turn it is. In fact, you can put this king on any square on the board, regardless of whose turn it is. As long as it's not an illegal move, black is going to be losing. This one is very easy. You just push, push, and you promote. You must know, as long as it's not an A or H pawn, with a king on the sixth, you're winning. Okay, let's go back to blockading. And as you see here, it's a successful, I would say, a successful Sicilian. Black dark square bishop is gone, traded for the knight, and white's looking beautiful over here. Now, currently, this pawn is hanging. They are attacking this pawn because if we take their queen, we'll take our queen. Not only is the goal to make get a good position, the goal is to blockade. And in this position, it's important that we try to make developing this bishop really difficult for our opponent. How should uh, how should we play? Always look for active moves. What's a good active move here? What's an active move that we can try to punish our opponent for? Problem with a move like queen e5 is it'll just go d6 and you're giving me exactly what I want. I get to open my bishop. Even if you take on f6, even though I get double pawns, I'm happy. You can do way better than that. e5. Okay, but now I play knight e4. Bishop e2, the issue is this pawn is hanging. Even though you take the queen, I take your queen. And it might seem that, oh, but don't I have this in between move of here? I go here. Bishop d3. Oh, you mean here, bishop d3? I can still take. This bishop actually doesn't change anything. e5 is the best move. You gave me the right move. I don't know if you wanted to change your mind after that, but e5 is the right answer. Uh, the knight moves to e4. And now what do we play? We could take advantage of the fact that our opponent's knight is going to be severely misplay misplaced in a few moves to our advantage. Yeah, Isaac, good job. Now, if we just simply maneuver to d6 like everyone says, this is not good because the knight will take the bishop and black is relatively happy. So, wow, Nader. Very good. 
very good. Very, very nice uh, practical move. And it is the best move. Very strong move here. Questionator, that move would be a mistake for Black. What? So where would be a better place to move the bishop? Yes. Well, I think you mean with uh, H4 Nader, right? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay, no problem. So we can't go here. So maybe we can make a waiting move first. We don't need to rush it because if the knight comes here, we could always kick it out with one of our moves. So where should we move the bishop instead so that we, we could later put the bishop on D6? We can't put it here now because it will be kicked out, but maybe we could put it there in two moves make sure their opponent's knight won't be there. Yeah, there's there's really two good moves here for white. Either bishop b4 or bishop a3. I'm okay with either one. If bishop a3, let's say knight a4, they're stopping us from going here, that doesn't really change anything. What will we play? C5, there's B6. Not so easy. Yeah, no bishop B5 there because knight C5. It's okay. We can really, we want to make sure this bishop can't develop. How can we blockade and ensure our opponent's pieces are completely stuck? We can absolutely suffocate our opponent's position. Now, we don't want to lose material. I wouldn't even consider that move right now. First, think about how do you make your opponent's pieces worse. Direct them to the worst possible square. Yeah, first that, and then that move. Yes, Nader. First b3. Now, if the knight goes here, it's definitely getting trapped. f3, and then we just take it with our king. And they go here. But now, finally, we can do what? After all this labor, manual labor, we can finally say, thank God. We've trapped it. We've trapped everything. Imagine having this position with white. I mean, it's, I would resign if I was black. I mean, honestly, the position is materialistically completely even, but what move is black playing? They can go F6, but you just go F4. Even if that F file opens up, they can't do anything. It's disgusting, right? I shouldn't show this. I, I think this is, this is uh, inappropriate on if the knight goes to e4, as Nader had knight a8, you mean? And then, but after even knight a8, Nader, where is the rook go, the knight going? Even here. Then what? So bad, right? You'd have to go b6, bishop b7, rook c8, knight c7, knight e8. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of wasted time. If white does nothing, then black will get out in 15 moves. That's what Nader and I agreed on. Okay. If the knight goes here. Trying to stop this move, how do we trap our opponent's knight here in two moves? Now you want to be careful here. Don't make sure you're, you don't give your opponent any chances. H4, but then what? The problem with H4 and then F3 is you provide the G3 square for the knight. So you want to be you want to make sure you're co correct about how you deal with the knight. Bishop D3 allows this F7 square. See, so precision is key. Precision is key. How do we play? H4 right now, but then what's your threat? As we discussed, F3 is not a threat. H4, bishop d3, then I go F5. You want to kick out the knight with the pawn first. And then when the knight moves, it has nowhere to go. And all it needs is just a little bit of an attack. How do we hit the g5 knight? We can uh, we can play the move h4. The knight is completely trapped. Okay, wow. This is this is my, one of my favorite positions to show. I have to show this. Talking about blockading. Every time I think about blockading, I think about this position. And it's it's black to play. Now, before we even talk about this position, this position was this game was uh, played by a world champion. In fact, he is the ninth world champion. Does anyone know who the ninth world champion is? I 
am, no, that's the 10th meter. Remember the 11th is Fisher. Fisher. So an easy way to remember is you go backwards from Fisher. Fisher is 11, Kasparov is 13. Uh, Tigran Petrosian or Petrosian or Petrosian, Tigran Petrosian as the English pronounce it, uh, is an, the Armenian world champion from 1963 to 1969, lost it, his title in, in 69 to Boris Spassky. This is one of the most incredible positions of all time. I know, Nader, right? It's unbelievable. It's unreal. This position is beautiful, no? That's why I'm here. I want to show you beautiful positions. There's so much chess out there. And this game is just stunning. Petrosian fought. B6 looks incredibly scary, opening up the queen. If we just make some random move, this position is absolutely hopeless. So we have to sacrifice our queen. And the idea is that if they do nothing, we could just lock everything and it's a draw. But what if they play h4? What if they play h4? Now, white has a very obvious idea of activating the queen. They also, if we play g4, they might even start trying to promote the pawn. We nonetheless have a fortress. The blockade? No, that was queen b6, right? Blockading. Yeah, that is a good job. We're able to simply take the pawn because when they try to come here, how will we be able to block their ability to bring their queen in? If they go queen h1. We can lock it in. But what if they take? Keep in mind, the same idea is in place for them. We reinforce. And there's actually no way for them to break through. A fortress. Stunning position. I, I wonder if I turn on the engine, what will it tell me? Uh, but you know, you look at the engine moves, it won't give you a win. It will give you just a bunch of moves and it won't, it won't show any win because it just doesn't exist. Uh, these are all the top engine moves. White has not made any progress and we can continue this. As you see, com computers, some of them, even to this day, overvalue material and this position is no exception. Okay. Is rook f5 winning for white? Obviously, we don't have to take. If we don't take, it's obviously a draw. Rook and bishop draws against a rook with good play, but rook and bishop against two pawns, easily a draw. But so we can we should only take if we think we're winning. Do we win if we take the bishop? It's a yes or no? Maybe the answer is no. Or maybe I'm here to reverse psychology or double reverse. I'll let you just think about it. Yeah, Charles. Yeah, you're right. Wins, I guess. <laughs> I like the confidence. I guess. Is this how you play chess? You make a move? Oh, maybe it's good. I don't know. Maybe it's good. Okay, very important. Uh, I know I'm not teaching end games, but maybe George will allow me to one day get that pleasure to do that. The most important thing when you're playing end games is you want to make sure everything is nicely coordinated together. You can't just randomly start pushing this pawn. This pawn is going to get lost. G6 instantly loses a pawn. Together. We're all in this together. No? Okay. Some high school musical. Okay. King G4. Tempos is good. Now, 
you think about the fact that this king is taking this route, it's closer to the F pawn. So our focus should not be pushing the F pawn. It should be focused on pushing the G pawn. And everything is nicely put together. So we can just start rolling. How do we roll them down? Look, F5 is not a bad move, but it's unnecessary at the current moment. We will play G6. Now, we cannot play G7. They will take the pawn. We play King G5. I want to make this clear. There's a lot of debate, especially among Soviet champions and strong chess players, the value of a king. But it is almost certainly valued stronger than a minor piece and less than a rook. It's somewhere between three and five points. But regardless, an active king is what's going to win you the game. We will definitely be able to do this. And now this pawn just goes on its own. Like, there's no, just literally nothing black can do. Uh, yes. Okay, Richard, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, is king g5 necessary? I like f5. Okay. The issue with this is actually what black makes it in time. Actually, no, black makes some time with this move, sorry. Wait, do they make it in time or am I wrong? Maybe I'm wrong. Just push here? No, but now you're actually not making it in time because you can't push anymore because I take. But maybe you can go king f5. Yeah, maybe this works as well, actually. Maybe this position is also winning. Yeah, then you can push. Also, King G6 wins. Yeah, yeah, maybe. It. Long story short, though, we should remove the blockading piece here. Now, a lot of times, though, we're playing on the other side. How can we avoid the blockade? Now, before we go too much into it, it's opposite color bishop endgame. We're up, a, we're up two pawns on the queen side, up a pawn in total, because it's three versus two here. When you have opposite color bishop endgames, do you want to put pawns on the same color of your bishop? or the same color of your opponent's bishop? What do you guys think? Do we put pawns on the same color of our bishop or same color of our opponent's bishop? Let's see who knows who has a good end game understanding. It's, on one hand, it's a 50-50 question. Yeah, if we're playing for a draw, I mean, uh, Nader made a perfect point that I was going to bring up. Nader, that's perfect, actually, what you said. If we're playing for a draw, we want to put our pawns on the same color of our bishop so our bishop can defend everything. However, when you're playing for a win, I'll write it down. The move b6 draws instantly. There's no way to advance. And even if we somehow pick, I mean, we will pick up this pawn. They'll just go bishop h5. And then when we bring our king, start bringing it back, they'll just come back. There's literally no, no way of winning. So we must put our pawns on the same color of our opponent's bishop, which means, what do we do? First a6, but let's say they we they see that the king's trying to come in. They're going to go here. Now what? Why did we go a6? Uh, we need to kick out the king, but we can't just push. Cover b6 with our bishop minion. Oh, we could do that, Richard. Yeah. That's actually the simplest way. There's many moves that win, but I want to show you the simplest way that wins, and this is what Richard gave me. So bishop d4 is winning, but the simplest route is to maneuver your king to help you push this pawn. And that's exactly what we want to do. 
And in fact, I wouldn't even play b7 to avoid the sacrifice. We could just bring in our king. And the bishop can never attack this pawn because then we'll just promote. But okay, here, this position is just so lovely. Every move wins. So I wouldn't go too much into the weeds in this position because who cares? We could do whatever we want here. Like if they even attack it here with our king blocking the bishop, even this is winning. Right? We'll either promote this way or we'll promote like this. Okay, completely winning. But just a small note of we want to avoid blockades and we have to play a six. Okay, this is actually a very familiar theme in this very famous game by Ulf Anderson against Gary Kasparov when Gary Kasparov was, I think, 18 or 19 years old. Ulf found this miraculous way of holding what seemed to be a bad position here. All right, let's see if you guys can find it. Gary is the 13th world champion, 1985 to 2000. For some people, for some reason, a lot of people think my dad looks like him. They're cousins. They're cousins. First cousin. Best friends. They, they're, they're calling each other right now. I believe Gary lives in New York, so it wouldn't be too far away. As the title suggests, we're going to be sacrificing for a blockade. And um, this position is quite unpleasant. It might not look unpleasant, but the natural move knight c5 is quite problematic because they can immediately take. You can't take with the queen. And if you take with the pawn, then suddenly d6. Okay. If we just move our queen, then this pawn is going to get some, some beatings, especially with this queen coming in. And if we go here, then suddenly this move. Very unpleasant positions. Like, what did we do to deserve this? Like, everything looked fine. So we're actually going to sacrifice the rook. Shocking move. But the point here is that the bishop is gone, and there's actually no way for them to break through anymore. How should we place, where should we, I should rephrase, where should we place our pieces? Where should we place them to hold on? Obviously, I want to make it clear, black is not trying to win here. I mean, they can if white really botches it, but. Nancy five. Suddenly defending the pawn. Okay. Now, how do we start putting pressure? Bishop e5, I wouldn't say is best. We really want them to go e4 to create more dark square weaknesses. How can we try to encourage the pawn to go to e4? So then we could block it. Bishop e5, you're trying to play for a win. Make sure you know, understand that we're not trying to play for a win. We're trying to make that pawn move. We're trying to put pressure on it. It's a weakness. We want to really focus our energy on that. I like rook e8. I like queen e7. They're both great. And but let's say here, let's say they make some move. Actually, you know what? They can't go here. There's bishop c3. So let me change the moves. Let's say this is a position. How do we try to put more pressure on this pawn? F5. Mm -hmm. I don't like the fact that we're weakening our king. I think it's not necessary. Bishop h6 is going to be difficult. In fact, king f2, we already have a perpetual. We can just come back and forth. For instance, we're happy with the draw because we're just down in exchange. But notice that the fact that dark square bishop really holds everything together. And it's not like their bishop is, not only it's gone, we've damaged their pawn structure as well. And we can establish concrete plans. Our opponent is basically just reacting to what we're doing. We're going to try to take this pawn next. Black is looking to have a terrific position. Okay, this is another uh, kind of interesting position. A, f a Dutch gone wrong. No, I, I'm, I know that we have a Dutch player here, so he might be aware of what to do when a Dutch goes wrong here. Oh no, one of my games. Yeah, white played the common g4 break to open it up. We can't move our rook because these pawns are hanging, two of them. But believe it or not, black is actually fine here. In fact, this position is better than the starting position for black. Isaac is right. How should we play? Look to improve your pieces, specifically your minor pieces.
The rook h5 loses the e6 pawn, so we don't want to do that. Although maybe it doesn't lose the e6 pawn, now that I think of it. Oh, no, it does. What am I talking? I thought bishop f7 traps the queen, but there's queen g4. Okay. I know a lot of you feel uncomfortable with the idea of losing material for a positional advantage, but that's why I'm here. I want to remove that sort of uncomfortability. Seek to improve your pieces almost at all costs. And obviously a pawn is worth less than the exchange, but we're going to sacrifice it here. If they don't take it, we can bring our rook back. But the point is that we got rid of their be best minor piece and we got to activate our worst one. Suddenly this pawn is hanging. That's not even going to be our focus. Our focus is going to be to try to open up the C file to get a rook active. Obviously they're going to try to mate us, but there's nothing really too scary here. We have bishop g6. We even have a g6. But I would say queen d7 is completely fine for black. And we could treat this almost like a French position. I think David Southern would enjoy this. Uh, a very famous uh, French player from Annex. And of course, we can deliver a fantastic outpost for our knight. Black is completely fine. More than fine. More than fine. Like, okay, let's say they play rook g1. Okay. Knight c6. I'm going to come here next. It's going to be really hard to attack because even if you get push your pawn all the way, we could take this pawn later. No rush. No rush. Why do we want this pawn right now? It's double double backward pawn. Seek to improve your pieces first. Bishop h6, we could just come back. Very safe. Very safe. And in fact, here we can maybe even play on the f file. Okay. Uh, let, let's let's change it up from sacrifice. We'll go back to sacrificing. Let, let's. I think I want to do an easy one. I've, we've been doing quite a few difficult positions, so let, let's bring it back. Bring it back. And let's do a fun tactical position. White to play and win instantly. I feel like Nader already solved it, yeah. I could see by his face. As soon as he's, he's looking down, I'm like, okay, he got it. Yeah, Isaac, Richard, and Nader are right. Anyone else? It's going to be a crazy move here. Shocking. Unnatural. Bizarre. Queen D1. I'm going to take your pawn. You're such a nice guy. I knew you and I were friends, and I mean, now you're proving it. Queen F8. What? Because here, we're not going to take the rook. We're going to promote to a queen. And then suddenly, the world is falling apart. Shocking move to distract that blockading piece. They have to take the rook. It's their only legal move. Imagine winning like this. It would take my breath away. That'd be, that could be kind of a fun way to uh, beat up on uh, your opponent. Okay, let, okay, this one is a game from the world champion, the soon to be not world champion, but he played this before he was a world champion. The tiny little Carlson. I think he played against Grishuk, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. White to play and win. Yeah, Richard, yeah, you, we wouldn't want any crimes happening in that scene. So, of course, white is looking to be in good shape, but black seems to be a good job controlling everything. Nader and Isaac are getting this quite easily, yeah? Nader gave me the right answer, but seems confused with his answer. Yes, that is good. No, you're not confused? You're happy? <laughs> D7, the problem is bishop uh, f6. Yeah, and uh, black is holding on to all the pawns. Yeah, we're going to do some some craziness. We're going to play bishop a6. Shocking move. Another shocking move. You're like, what? You're just giving me the bishop? But what is the point of doing this? What is going to be our follow-up? What will white play?
Now we want to make sure we push the right pawns correctly. Yes. So if we play d7, they're going to play bishop f6. And But actually, I, I'm actually wrong. There's actually two right answers. Nader, your move obviously is also good. Uh, your move is good too, Nader. It's good, yeah. We could play the move c6. Yeah, the position, they're just not able to hold on to everything. And c8 is protected by our pawn. We could also, as Nader suggested, play c6. Three pawns because of the same issue. They take them. Okay. Some big problems. Some stunning move, bishop a6. And in fact, I want to take this pawn. You go here, fine. Actually, maybe I should ask. Should, what move should I play? What moves? Maybe I kind of gave away the first move. But what moves should I play here? How should I continue? D7, there's bishop D8. Yeah, C6 is right. Good job. Now what? Now we cannot allow the rook to control that C pawn because if we lose the C pawn, they can sacrifice the bishop for the D pawn. So this pawn is incredibly important. Yeah, there's there's just nothing to do. It's it's the same problem. It's the same problem. We're defending the pawn, and our next move is going to be here. What can we do? Bishop can go here, but so rook c1, and we just are able to promote our pawn. Okay, this one is a. I think as soon as it's a, a few of you see it. Instantly, you guys get the answer. Sometimes, usually, the blockade is a piece, as we come to learn. But sometimes, a pawn can be a blockade, and uh, this is a very tasty win. In fact, my father once beat one of China's top GMs, female GMs, uh, Zhao Xie. She was like twenty five hundred. She was like I don't know, maybe tenth in the world for women, and he won with a similar tactic about 15 years ago in the Canadian Open. And it's with this move, bishop h5. Because if they take, well, why just give up our bishop? Just out of the kindness of our hearts? No, I mean, obviously our opponent's bishop is quite rubbish. All the pawns are on the same color as the bishop. But we're able to break through. And if they ignore us, I mean, okay, that's fine. I still want to promote my opponent. Yeah, this game is played by the best player that never became world champion. Consider the best player to never become world champion. Let's see if you guys can get figure out who I'm talking about. He is a defector. A defector. Wow, Richard, well done. A defector from the Soviet Union. And moved to a country that he lived in for the rest of his life, recently passed away, lived in Switzerland, played in three world championship matches, and kept on losing to Anatoly Karpov, the person that my dad cheered for his whole uh, youth, and who he told me that I had to cheer for, Viktor Korchnoi. Viktor the Terrible, I think, is what people nicknamed him because of his sometimes bad manners. I can tell you a true story. This is a, I don't know if, I don't think anyone knows this. I had the opportunity once in my life to play Victor Korchnoi when I was a little kid. I think I was eight years old. And he had just finished giving a sign or something. He was somewhere. And he, I was there and he's like, okay, I guess I'll play this little kid. And first game, he's like talking with other people. I think he's talking with my dad too. They're talking in Russian. And we're playing five minutes with one of those old clocks where you can't exactly see those analog clocks. We can't see exactly which time is on the clock. He's not really paying attention at all to the clock. He's completely destroying me on the board and he loses on time. I'm completely losing, loses on time. And then for about one minute, he expresses to my father and me about how I'm such a poor player at eight years old and I have no hope in chess, I should give up and I'm a poor sport. Keep in mind, I've done nothing wrong. So the next game, he like sits down, he's focused. 
he absolutely obliterates me. He's like, all right, I've evened the score. And I'm like, great. An eight-year-old has evened the score. So I can tell everyone now that he's passed away, I have evened the score, luckily, against Victor the Terrible. Yeah, I should have, no. A win is a win. You got to take those. You got to take those, you know? This, uh, at one point, considered for many years, for over a decade, considered the second best player in the world. I'm going to take that Blitz win. Now, I have, I have a lot of weird anecdotes like that about uh, random people. All right, uh, this is an endgame, a pawn endgame. And it seems like there are some blockades on our pawns, certainly. These pawns are blockading here. How can we win? And in fact, Victor is playing for the losing side here. So I don't even know why I mentioned him. He was playing for the black pieces. White to play and win. We're going to be combining the idea of Zug's wing and breakthroughs. Well, Milan's right. Um, if the move h3, black has b5. And this, I think, draws. because we're unable to create a pass pawn. The, the pass pawn focus should be the A pawn. The question is, how do we do anything about it? And so obviously there's two pawns in our way. And the first move is B5. Now, if he brings this king back, we're winning not because of any idea other than Zug's winning. His king is gonna try to control our pawn. That's fine, our king breaks in. Isaac is right, we're gonna bring in our king. Getting the pawn, and if when they play here, actually, I think every move wins, other than f4 and a5 and d6. So any move that doesn't lose material wins. But I would say king h5 is yeah, king h5 is great. And in fact, you shouldn't even run after h3. What's the simplest move that wins? You can go king g4 to take the pawn, Milan. Not yet, but that is the right idea, but just not at the moment. Nader, yeah, king h6. Yeah, it's good. I thought there's g4, but you can come back. King h6 wins. I would play f3 just out of principle, but okay, everything is good here. So Korshnoi plays king h5. White to play and break through the pawn blockade. Yes, I think that's right. We can push our pawn. Now, what's the point? If they ignore us, or let's say they try to bring their king back. What do we play? But what if they tip? We will distract this last pawn because of what? Why, why lose all of our pawns? For what cause? Because... We're going to get that protected pass pawn to promote. The king is just shy. Could be nice to our opponent and promote the pawn. So we're both nice in the idea of losing pawns, but very Canadian win, right? Sacrificing to, to win. Now, not every blockade is good, obviously. Don't always think, oh, I, Mark taught us blockades. I blockaded, yes. Not the right reaction. And this is an example where. You could even argue it's an overreaction. What black has a blockade on our pawn? Of course, this pawn is weak, it's isolated, and it's a for, very far advanced, could be pressured more, but this is tactically losing. I'm gonna not give any hints because some of you are too strong, stronger than me, probably. But I think you guys can let's see if anyone can solve this without any hints. But after a minute. Even if people do solve it, I will start giving some hints. White to play, yeah. Kind of already did give you a hint. Uh, Isaac, and then what? Don't just give me one move. Give, tell me the tactic. This is a tactical solution, not a positional one. This is a tactical win yeah isaac has given me the right answer
Nader, but can't I just uh, take it even? Yeah, probably. Wait, that right now or after your first move? Right. No, but then I can't I take that too? You give me everything. You're such a nice guy. I want to play you. Just give me everything, all your pieces. And Milad, what do you mean? C takes B? What do you mean C takes B? It's uh, white to play here. There's nothing. The, the only C is this. The only piece on the C. Okay, I'll give you one hint. One. It has to do with this king. If this king was on h8, this tactic would not exist. Okay, no problem. We, we've already done quite a few ideas. We talked about generally blockading. We talked about removing the blockading piece, avoiding it, and sacrificing for it. Richard, you're close, just wrong move order. You could do more damage with a better move order. Much more damage. The right answer is, and actually Nader gave me the same answer as Richard. You guys need to just change the move order. Change the move order. We will take on F6. Sacrificing instantly. But Nader, basically, you saw it as well. And the point is what? Well, they have to take. Obviously, if they don't take. We've not only taken a pawn, we're going to destroy the king. So they have to take. And why didn't we just give away a bishop? I mean, we are Canadians here. But why did we actually give away a bishop? Knight takes d6 now. Hitting the bishop, so they have to take our knight. And now the very basic tactic to be up material. We're down a knight for a pawn, but okay, if they don't take, we king, obviously, we were up a pawn there. That's great. Game over. So takes, takes, resign. Okay, let's let's do twelve. Twelve is easier. Okay, we have two positions left. As always, I'm sorry if I go a little bit over. I know that's hopefully that's okay. So this is a Nimzo almost gone wrong for Black because we got that classic structure. We lost our dark square bishop. We doubled our opponent's pawns. You could see this in a lot of Nimzo. Our knights are just horrendous, as is our bishop. Every minor piece we have is horrible. And white just wants to open up the king side, play e5, and kill us. But that's kind of the hint. If we can figure out a way to mute our opponent's bishop and queen, we'll be really happy. It's going to involve creating some counterplay. How should white, how should black play to get some activity? Let's start about giving us creating some active play here for black. Isaac, you're right. But first, Let's weaken up our opponent's king a little bit. Notice that the bishop and queen have to hold the pawn, right, Isaac? So before your move, what move should we play? Yes. We take the rook. Notice the bishop can't take back. That hangs their pawn. They have to take with the king. Now, if we go queen h4, this is a step in the wrong direction because you give knight f3. Even with rook f8, they will just move their king over. And... Then e5, I mean, this is not necessary. How can we stop our opponent from opening up the diagonal? Isaac is right. And this touches on what we spoke about earlier. We're going to be sacrificing briefly just to create that blockade to ensure our opponent's position can open up. We play the move e5. Now, even though they can play here, we're so happy to 
slowly bring in our pieces because we completely lock the the position and black is going to get active on the king side. Now, if they take the pawn, this is just a disgusting set of pawns. I've never seen something more hideous. How should, <laughs> maybe a brief overreaction. How should black play? Why do we give up the pawn? Why? But why? In this position. No, 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 no. What? I mean, we could blockade, but it's not necessary. First of all, this knight can do the blockading. This d6 knight is, the, is not the only piece we have, but that's not necessary. Let's just keep it simple and regain material. How can black regain the material here? Don't overthink it. This is not at all a trick. This pawn is very bad. And we can just... Also, don't be afraid of them going like this in e e5. This, even though they open up our king, this actually tactically doesn't even work for them. Let's see if anyone sees it. Why is taking the bishop just, I mean, they're just losing here with one move. Yeah, Nader, yeah. Nader sees every tactic. Anytime I ask, any mistake I've made this whole class, Nader's the first one to point it out. Nader's tactics is, if I had his tactics, maybe I'd be a grandmaster. Queen h6, you have even better. H3. Yeah, H3 is much better. I agree with you. Okay. Obviously, they're not going to do that, but now we can blockade and we can attack and life is fantastic. Okay, which one have we not done? We haven't done 13 and we'll wrap it up with 13. Black has what looks to be just a horrible position. Everything has gone wrong. What is this rook doing on F6? H6 is a problem. Bishop G5. Isaac, and then what? What's your next move going to be? So Isaac, let's say um, let's say I do that. What will you play? But then don't I have um, okay, Nader, that's right. Isaac, can I do that? If we take, the issue is, let's say we bring in the knight, right? Our position is horrible because our bishop is disastrous with all these pawns. They can start attacking here. H6 is going to be the next move. We can't play H6 ourselves because they can sack. It, it really is just one of those, we're going to lose position. Rook F4. Just a stunner of a move. Why? Well, if they don't take, we're just going to take this pawn. So they have to take. Now, what's 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 the intention of taking? What's the intention of doing this? Why? Okay, Milan and Charles. What's the point? Let's say they play some move. How can Black seek to improve their pieces? Yeah, how? What does that look like? Well, this move actually allows us to regain material. The fact that we lose this pawn allows this bishop to eventually get on this diagonal. Queen C7. We could defend the pawn, yeah. We also have knight e5, which I like as well, because if queen takes pawn, what do we play? Yeah, maybe attack as well on the king side. Of course, we're regaining material, and even though we're, we, let's say they do this, even though they have, um, they're up a pawn, our bishop is going to be phenomenal in this diagonal. This pawn is not really handy. Well, maybe, maybe it's better to play something more accurate. You don't actually have to do this. You could also take this pawn because now a5 and b2 are hanging. It's important to know that e5 is not a good move here. Why not? It seems like we have just blundered, but what move can black play? And then what? With what I do. Yeah. Nader's tactics, as I say, it's just... How are you so good, Nader? Oh. 
But we take, of course, this is not good. It, look, it looks like every 10 seconds later, maybe. Maybe more than every day. Yeah, this is horrible. So the sack is actually a very thematic one. When you're sacrificing material, look for two things. Try to remove your opponent's best place pieces. That's number one. The number two, look, think about how you, that will help improve your own pieces. So when I give you homework, that's going to be part of the deal. When you're doing, obviously, when you're doing a tactical sacrifice, there might be different elements. But a positional sacrifice, it's about how can we remove our opponent's best place pieces, the ones that are the strongest, to improve and also improve our worst place ones. This does both. We have the idea of just getting everything active very nicely, and all of our opponent's pawns suddenly start falling like dominoes. Okay, I think I keep on stopping way too late, so I really, hopefully I don't upset you guys. This is still public, right? So here is the, yeah, Richard, let's try not to do that. Obviously, sacrificing to create blockades is something you should rarely do, but this is a judgment call. We have such horrible pieces, and that's why it makes sense. Don't just be like, okay, Mark said sacrifice sometimes, so I'm doing it. Woo. No, Rook at four here makes sense because we're both activating this bishop. We're activating the knight. And this is H6 doesn't do anything. And we could also open the E file for a Rook. So we're literally activating every piece possible while at the same time getting rid of their best minor piece. So it's worth it. It's worth it. Okay. I think that, oh, maybe I should stop recording here.